Well, if you have your Bible with you this morning, I ask you open to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Lord be with us this morning. I want to try to continue our thoughts through this book. Uh, as daunting as the book of Corinthians is to try to study, and as long as it is, I do. I am thankful that the Lord is continuing to press it on my heart and mind. It's a book that covers many different things. I know that it will be profitable to us. So I do encourage you very much to be praying as we continue through this. Last week we attempted to look here in the third chapter and be reminded again as we try to continue those thoughts this morning of Paul writing to the church at Corinth encouraging them to build the church. Reminding them that it's not the elder that builds it, it's the elder that plants the seed, it's the elder that waters the seed that's planted. It is the people of the congregation that readies their soil and readies their hearts and minds for it. It is all of them working together, but it is God that gives the increase. We cannot lose sight of that. We cannot lose thoughts of that, of the absolute importance and necessity for us as a church to trust in the Lord to make our efforts profitable. Does that make sense? That's basically what I was trying to get across last week in a nutshell. That we need to trust in the Lord to make our efforts profitable in building and continuing the church. Many times in my youth, and I do want to try to get past this, but many times in my youth I can remember, uh, it, even not so much in my youth, I can remember others that talk about how it's not our place to build the church. Uh, how many of you heard if the Lord wants them there, they'll be there? You're not going to find that in Scripture. A church that depends on the doors to magically open and the fish to magically jump in the boat or about like Bert and Ernie sitting in the boat singing here, fishy, fishy, fishy. I've not had a fish jump in yet. It's not going to happen. The fact of the matter is God wants people in His church. It is His will for His people to gather together and to worship Him until He returns. His Scripture tells us that. We do not have to question God, is it your will for us to gather together and to worship you? Yes. Is it His will for His church to cease prior to His return? No. But he tells us in his word, and we've tried to look at that here in Corinthians, and Paul is trying to exhort the church to be about the Father's work in continuing and building and growing the church until he returns. And I want to try to continue those thoughts a little bit this morning and carry them a little bit further. We're down to one of our token verses. We're down to one of those we like to run to and hurry up and get to in Corinthians. If you would read with me here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And this is what I want to look at this morning. Paul writes very similar words again in the 6th chapter. They sound very similar. They're very close, closely connected to one another. But I want to try to keep them separate as I believe they are separate thoughts. In the 6th chapter of Corinthians, Paul tells them, Know ye not that your body is the temple of God. Sounds very similar. But I want us to understand that they're different. 
And I want us to look exactly what it is that Paul is trying to write here. Paul comes to the church at Corinth and asks them a question that I ask you the same thing this morning. Dude, did you know that you are the temple of God? Did you know that the Spirit of God dwells within you? Did you know that? To an nth degree, there should be a part of you that goes, well, of course. I know that. Scripture tells us that. I've known that from my youth. I've known that uh, from very early on in Christianity and trying to learn and study. I know that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. I know that it talks about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, teaching us all that we need to know. I know that Jesus, before He ascended, told His disciples that He would send them the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Yes, of course I know that. What a silly question, Paul. Why would you ask such a thing? Well, he is mirroring some teachings of Christ. And I'm going to try to kind of set the, the tone here. If you'll go with me to Matthew 19, you see that Jesus used this same teaching method of asking questions to try to probe thoughts. In Matthew 19... If you want to turn there, you can. If not, it's just a couple of verses that I'm going to read quickly before, as we discuss them. Jesus is talking to some Pharisees, and he asks a similar type of kind of a silly question. Uh, 19.3 says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And to answer their question, he gives them a question. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that which he made, that which he made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Let me consider who he's talking to here. These are the Pharisees that have spent their life studying the Word and reading the Word and rewriting the Word as the scribes did. Uh, they were required to entirely copy the first four books of the Bible handwritten by themselves. Of course they'd read. What a silly question. When Jesus comes to the Pharisees and says, Have you not read? Well, of course we have. Didn't you know that when God created... Let me ask you this. Did you know... That when God created humanity, He made them male and female? Those are the options. There's not a T or a Q attached there. Politically incorrect or not, Scripture says God created male and He created female. If there's any confusion of that, look at nature. How many different kinds of dogs are there? Male and female. That's the way God made it. <coughs> Have you not read that? Of course the Pharisees had. He's probing their thoughts. He's causing them to think. He's causing them to, to oh, yeah, we've read that. They weren't successful at tempting him. Paul is doing the same thing here at Corinthians. He has been for some time... Uh, going at them about how they have lifted Paul and Apollos and, and arguing between the two and which one's greater, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, which one, uh, losing sight of the gospel. He has in, reminded them that the gospel is the, 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 of the utmost importance. And he just finished talking to them about building the church. And let me ask you, try to get you thinking the same way. I saw the head nods. I heard the amens. Thank you, by the way. When I come to you and I tell you that we cannot have the attitude, if, if God wants them here, they'll be here. 
That's an unbiblical, unscriptural attitude. And the truth of the matter is, it is our responsibility, our calling to use the Word of God and that which He has given us to go out into the world, in the world that we live in, that is a mixed up bag of nuts and we can't tell which one's up, which one's down, and who's going to think what today compared to tomorrow, but yet it is still our job to go out into the world and get people to come in here with us. Sound like an easy task? Oh, well, why ain't you done it yet? I mean, if it's so easy. It's daunting, isn't it? How are we going to accomplish that? Kind of makes you think, well, if it hasn't happened yet, when's it going to? Right? I mean, come on, don't leave me here hanging by myself being the only one that thinks these things. I know I'm not. And I don't think Corinthians thought any different than you. It was a nation completely given over to idolatry and whoredom, literal whoredom. Paul's going to address that in the coming books, in the coming chapters here. And if God continues with us, we will too, because America's kind of the same way. I imagine it was daunting even to them. Well, come on now, this is first century. There's so many people remembered Jesus being there. So many people had seen Him alive and well. I mean, if they can't do it, how are we? It's daunting. So He probes their thoughts. Did you not know that you are the temple of God? And that God dwells with you. Consider that thought for a minute. Consider the reality of this. Don't let it be a token verse that we put on our refrigerator or, or have around our home that we look at and we smile, but we don't really contemplate the, the seriousness of that. Think about what you're saying. God. The creator of everything. The one that knows everything can be everywhere at the same time, every time at the same time, can create everything from nothing just from the power of His words. He is able to do all. He knows all, has compassion above all, and love for His people that will never cease and can do all of these things. That God, the God that can hold the entirety of the span of the universe in the palm of His hand, that God dwells here on earth. Can you imagine the seriousness of that and the complexities of that? The awesomeness of that. There should be no higher exhortation or higher uh, lift to our spirits to realize that God is not imaginary. God is not held to a place of being a little old man in a white robe with a gray beard sitting on a chair hanging out in heaven and handing out Werther's originals. Y'all know that? And I'm trying to be silly and make you smile, but I'm serious. That's not God. Do y'all know that? He's real. And He is not like Satan that is held down by chains and can only go as far as God lets him. God's the one that's control over him and God can do what He wants, when He wants, how He wants. Amen. And can be anywhere He wants to be. And He chooses to be here. Does it get better than that? What a turn. Paul is chewing on them, chewing on them, chewing on them, getting on them, telling them you've got to do better, you've got to think better, you've got to get your mind turned, you've got to get pointed towards the gospel, and let me tell you how you're going to do it. You need to realize who's with you. As daunting as the world may seem, how much more powerful is God? 
Let me let you in on a biblical secret that's not a secret. The world is only going to get more daunting. The world is only going to get worse. It can't get worse than this. Wait and see. Yes, it can. But God will still be infinitely bigger, stronger, wiser, better, and able. Y'all getting it yet? That's why he asked this question here. That's what he wants them to understand. He wants them to get the awesomeness and the complexity of the thought of the realization that God dwells with men. Because so many of the first century thought that was over. Because they had seen Jesus. They had seen Jesus walking on the earth. And they, because He rose from the grave and they saw Him again, realized He really was God. But now He's not here anymore. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. Right? Was He there anymore? No, He wasn't. Jesus went home. So many needed reminded that though, if I can use this terminology and y'all be for, you know, mindful of what I'm saying, that one went home, but God's still here. We need reminded of that. God in human flesh body had gone home, but God is still with us. The church at Corinth needed reminded of that. As much as I believe we need reminded of that. So, let me ask you the question. What temple is he talking about here? I know the thoughts. There's two standings on this. One standing is that ye are the temple of God and he is talking about you individually. Right? Right? That I can tell you, I held to that for a very long time. And that should let you know that that's not where I'm going with this this morning. I held to that very strongly for a very long time because I know that to be the truth. Again, I know we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. I know He indwells us and He is the one that regenerates us. I know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Know ye not your body is the temple of God. And there he is talking about your physical body. I know that. But here he's not. Here he is talking about something that I have heard and seen over the last few years the majority of Christianity belittle and negate and overlook and they need reminded again of what Paul is writing to the church at Corinth the temple that he is writing about here is the church house he's talking about the church house well they didn't have those then first century they were from house to house they didn't have a church yeah, they did. In order to understand this, and I really do encourage you to be praying this morning that I'm able to do this, I need to get you to understand the difference between you and the church. Because there is a difference. We need to understand what the church is. That's what he's writing about here. The church is the temple. Here he is writing to the congregation as a whole. He is writing to the church at Corinth. And he's been talking to them about how the, the minister came and planted the seeds that grew them into the church. And there was the next preacher that came and watered and fed that which had been planted. And the people had tended their soul and had worked their hearts. And God had gave the increase and they had grown and built upon the sure foundation that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And they had built upon that. And He said the fires are going to come and they're going to test and try that which you're building. 
you need to understand what you're building is the temple of God. The church. The church is important. The church is not some small thing. And we do not have permission to define the church. We do not get to say what is and is not church. We hear this a lot today. But the church is defined in Scripture. And it is a very well-defined thing. And it is something that we need to know and understand in order to understand what Paul is writing here. The church, according to Scripture, is a congregation. The church is not a family. So many times from this uh, outbreak that has come and this virus that has come out, I've heard and I've seen it, and I've seen good brothers and sisters share it, and I kind of cringe when I see it. I mean, there's even been memes made about it. Satan whispered with this one, he's going to destroy the church. God laughed and says, I'll have a church in every house. No. Don't allow that thinking to come into your mind. You cannot and will not have a church at home. Well, that's awful harsh. That's scripture. A church is not a family. Where two or three are gathered together, there shall I all be also, is not talking about church. Where two or three gather together and say we're here to worship God, does not make it a church. Where people gather together and try to teach morality and teach good thinkings, does not make it a church. By Scripture... And I don't have time to go give you all the chapters and verses and all of the different references, but I'd love to give them to you if you've got questions or doubts. By Scripture, the church is a congregation. They were first called Christians at Antioch, which is a church. It was a congregation of people. It is a congregation that is well-defined and brought together. Uh, it is one that has a pastor. In order for you to have family church at home, one of you is going to have to be a pastor. Are you? Then you're not a church. One of you is going to have to be a preacher. Are you? Then it's not church. It's a congregation. It's a congregation with order. It is a congregation that is designed with a pastor or elders. It is one with preachers that's able to teach and is called on to do the teaching. It is a congregation of believers that gather together and are willing to take the Lord's name. It is a congregation of people gathered together. You can see it so many times in Scripture. To the church that is at Corinth. To the church in Galatia. To the churches in Galatia. To the church at Ephesus. Look at Revelation to the seven churches. They were defined congregations in a specific place designed for people to gather together and to worship God. And he says in Revelation that the Spirit dwelled among the seven candlesticks, which were the seven churches. Much of the world and the world's teachings today want to negate and take away the importance and the authority of the church. And we cannot allow that. And that's what Paul's writing to here. 
He's writing to that congregation and he's trying to get that congregation. It's the same as I'm standing right now in the pulpit of Salem Primitive Baptist Church in Damascus, Arkansas, and I'm telling you congregation, we need to know when we assemble together, I trust God is in our midst. That makes us a church. That makes the difference. And this has been taught all the way from Old Testament. I want you to look with me in 1 Kings chapter 8. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 8 uh, is... I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to read a couple of little verses here and there to try to give you the, the importance and the, the emphasis that is given. But this is where Solomon has completed building the temple. Uh, the last time I was reading through this, the Lord really uh, pressed something on me that I'd not really considered or thought before. And then going through Corinthians here has reminded me of it again. Uh, I'm, I understand and I know with what I'm telling you this morning, you're not going to find chapter and verse where it tells us to have a church building or a church house in the New Testament. You're not going to find chapter and verse on that because it's not there. When Israel first come out of Egypt, they didn't have one either. Did y'all know that? When they first took the land of promise, when they finally were willing to go in, they didn't have one either. They had a tent, a tabernacle, by God's design and by God's specification. They was able to go to each one of the tribes. They had a spot set aside that that temple, that tabernacle could set up that they could gather and worship. But after a length of time, when they were established, God placed it on the heart and mind of David to build a house unto God. And Solomon did it. God wouldn't allow David to do it for all kinds of reasons, and I don't have time for all of that this morning. I just want us to get to the point here where Solomon has completed the temple, and they now have a house, a dwelling place, a set location intended for the people to gather together to worship God. This is new. There came a time in the New Testament church where this was new. Yes, you'll find in the New Testament to the church that is in the house of different people. That's where it started. And that's where it grew. And now we have the church house as we're established. I think you can find that mirrored here in 1 Kings chapter 8 uh, very well. Look here in ver chapter 8 verse 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Did y'all catch that? Mm -hmm. Filled the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon. The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in. A settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. This is at the very ending of the building of the temple. They've got it finished. They've got it established. They've got everything in there. They've got the two cherubims in the holy of holy place. And they take the Ark of the Covenant in and they set it under there. As soon as they set the Ark in the holy of holy place and pulled out the staves and leaned them up in the corner as God designed it, as soon as the priest started to walk out, the cloud filled that place. Know ye not that ye are the temple 
And the Spirit of God dwells, lives, stays, fills that place. Solomon says, I've now built you a house. Did he think that he had pigeonholed God and, and, and put Him in a place that he couldn't do anything else? You see that he gets the seriousness of it and, and the complexity of it. And this is what people are trying to, to fight against when they tell you that, well, when he's talking about the church, he's talking about the individuals and the spirits in the individuals. And wherever you're at, then there's the church. No, it's not. Because they think we're trying to say we're the only place that God can be. It's not what I'm saying. But I want you to see the importance of gathering here. As we're supposed to. Solomon understood this. If you'll skip over to the 27th verse. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. Solomon gets the complexity of this. He gets the sheer awesomeness of the statement that know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the God dwells with you. He said, how is this possible? He's standing here looking at the temple. He's fixing to pray a prayer over the temple, over the house of God, and he is standing before it, looking at it, and cannot even see inside of it for the smoke is filled. It's so full, they can't even see the minister. They've had to come out. He's looking upon it, and it's just blowing him away. It's amazing him that God is here. How is this possible, God? The heaven of heavens cannot contain you. He knows God is everywhere. That's what omnipresent means. He's everywhere at the same time. He knows He's large enough to hold the entirety of the universe in the palm of His hands and the small of His hands. And He's, how is this possible? How awesome is it? Have you ever been at a church meeting and there's not a doubt, not a question in your mind God was there today? You just sit. And you can't help but think the same things that, Paul, that Solomon is saying here. The heaven of heavens is not able to hold you, God. How is it possible that you're here in this place at this time to be with us? He gets it. Yet, verse 28, he says, Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant, and to this supplication. Now if this is not your prayer for the church, you need to think about it. Because this is awesome. O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there. That thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and to thy people Israel. When they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. And when thou hearest, forgive. That's a prayer for the church. Lord, fill this house. Make this house a place that we look forward to being at. Make this house a place that we turn to. Make this place, this house be a place that we come together and seek you and expect to find you. I know you dwell in heaven. Solomon gets that. That's the omnipresence of God. Heaven is your dwelling place, but Lord, I know you can fill this house as you are today. Make this place, this house. I want you to get the emphasis of that. This house, this house. Be a place that we look for Him and come together. And a place that when we gather, Lord, you hear us and you honor us. And that you come and be with us. That's what the church is intended to be. That's what the church house is intended to be. 
And the reason I think this connects so well with the New Testament church house as we celebrate and we come together in today, it says this is the place, look again in verse 29, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, that God has said, my name shall be there. What is the church compared to? The bride of Christ. Those that willingly take the name of the Lord. The place where God gives His name. When you're married, the bride takes the name of the husband and that's not an archaic, overbearing something that we should just try to avoid. It's just so old school. It's such honor. It's such a gift. It's one of the reasons I think that God uses the picture of the marriage with His church, the bride. And the husband gives his name unto her and shares it. We see how serious Jesus takes this. Well, this is just thus saith John. We see how serious Jesus takes this. There is only one recorded time, and I've really got to hurry up because I'm going to run out of time. And if I do, oh well, it'll just be a part B. There is only one time recorded in Scripture where Jesus takes part in an open punishment on people. Not a time where He calls them hypocrites, generation of vipers, or any of the above. This wasn't a time where Jesus spoke uneasy about a people. There is a time and a point in the meekest of men Y'all keep that in mind. When it says we need to be meek like Christ, He was the meekest of men, the humblest of men. But there is a recording in Scripture where Jesus stood outside of a place and took the time. This was contemplated. There are those that say He went in and it upset Him and He threw a temper tantrum. No. No. There is a recording in Scripture where he stood outside of a place and made a whip. That takes time. There is a time where Jesus stood outside of a certain place and made a whip, and when he went in, he went in for a reason. Where was that? It was the temple. How serious does he take his house? He went into the temple and he began to overturn the tables and flip them over and drive people out, beating them with a whip and driving them out of the temple, out of his house. Because he said, my house, did y'all get that? My house will be called the house of prayer. And you've made it a den of thieves. Now if the church is a person, show me the person that he went to and whipped them for by and above. The church is not a person. When Paul, he knows this personally, when Paul, then being known as Saul, set out to destroy what we celebrate today, the very thing that he is teaching in Corinthians to gather together as the church, when Saul of Tarsus set out to destroy the church and drag people out of it and kill them for worshiping God in it, what did Jesus say to him? Paul, or Saul, why persecutest thou me for killing this individual? It's 
not what he said. Why persecutest thou me? And Saul, and I'm just going to throw this one in for free, already knowing he was Lord. Don't get that for free. Said, Lord, how persecutest I you? Because you do it unto my church. You're doing it to my congregations. You're going into my house and you're messing with my bride. And if you're messing with my bride, you're messing with me and I will not put up with it. Jesus takes the church seriously. This is not some new thing. The, the temple was finished and filled and, and Solomon praised that prayer over it and praised that the Lord would uh, answer his prayer and to honor the temple, honor the house, and honor the people that gather together in it and to hear them. And when there's famines, when the people would gather here and worship and pray, he would heal their lands. When there's pestilence with the people will gather here and worship that you will hear us and heal our lands. When we have sinned, when we gather here and pray and seek your face, you'll forgive us. Solomon prays throughout the remainder of the 8th chapter. It's all one continuous prayer seeking and asking that the Lord would be in him and and God answers his prayer at the start of chapter 9. And I want to read it. It says, And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire which he pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And if thou walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. God answers his prayer and comes to him and tells him, I've heard your prayer, Solomon. It was a good thing that it was placed on the heart and mind of a man to build the Lord a house. You want to know how I know that? Because God showed up. If God didn't want there to be a particular house built for him to be come and worshipped in, he wouldn't have shown up. He says, I've hollowed this house and I'll be here as long as you honor me in it. That's the church. Y'all getting it? The church is a congregation of people. It is a congregation of people grouped together that come together to a certain place. Even when it was in houses in the very beginning of the first century church, it was a particular house that they came to. And they gathered together under the ear of a pastor and a preacher and a teacher. Just as Jesus said in Ephesians, I have gave you pastors and teachers. He's given these things. And the elders of the church, and they've gathered together and they worship Him as He designed with singing, praying, and preaching. Just as we do today. It is a place where you gather together in a specific way, in a specific place, as a specific congregation worshiping a specific God. That's church. And you don't get to name it. You don't get to place it. You don't get to say, well, I think we can do it over here, meaning that, well, if me and my family won't stay home, we're still going to have church. No, you won't. Can you worship? Yes, you can. Can you teach? Yes, you can. And you should. But you cannot have church at home. You cannot have church in a deer stand. You cannot have church while you're fishing. You cannot have church without gathering together as He designed. And God honors this. 
And that is exactly what Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth when he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple, that you, the church, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. But we, as we, as we teach that, as I encourage you in it, we need to understand that it comes with warning. Something that is this important and God takes this serious to the point that He comes down on Saul for persecuting the church, something that Jesus openly punishes people for abusing, He takes it serious. The church is serious. The church is something we're supposed to take serious. It's supposed to be this important. If you know that God dwells with us, does He? I really hope and trust He does. If we know that, we need to understand our part. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 3. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Just as we've seen how Jesus takes it serious and openly punishes those that defiled the temple, made it the den of thieves. Just as we've seen how Jesus came down on Saul for persecuting the church and corrected him openly, we need to understand that Jesus takes the church seriously and we are not allowed to make it what we want. Any man that defiles the church, him will God destroy. Now we've got to keep this in context as well. What does it mean to defile it? What does it mean to be destroyed? Sins how I've only got five minutes, y'all are going to get a part B because I didn't get done. So I just want you to think about that over the week and next week we'll try to look at what does it mean to defile the temple because I'm out of time. And how we can protect ourselves from doing that. Because we can. For today, I just simply want you to know and understand the importance of the church. And that it's our calling to continue it. You little ones, and I say that from my age and south, and I'm not leaving the old ones out. I made the mistake of thinking the church was nothing. And I'll get around to it when I'm ready. I, I encourage you with this as I close. If you don't take the church serious, who do you think's going to? And who do you think is going to have the doors open when you finally get around to it? There is no promise that the church will be here tomorrow. There is a promise that there will be a church had here on this earth until the day the Lord comes, but there is no promise that the church at Salem here in Damascus will be here next year next month or 50 years from now if we are not the people that take the names lord of the name of the lord and take it serious and celebrate the fact that he says he'll be here with us where else would you want to be because there's nowhere you're going to find him like you do here just think about that for the week. Thank you, and God bless.